Nicole Etchison is going to speak to us uh, today about Buffalo Bill's uh, Civil War. Um, she is um, a distinguished uh, academic and uh, she holds the Alexander M. Bracken uh, position prof as professor of history at Ball State University in Indiana, the university built by JARS, I guess we could say, uh, long before Jar Jar Binks. Uh, appeared. Uh, ball jars are important in the history of America. Um, and David Letterman went to Ball State too. Was he one of your students? No. You're, I know you're, I was a joke. I, even as I said it, I realized I didn't want to go down that road. No, she's, she's just a baby. Um, but despite her youth, she has uh, had a marvelous uh, publishing career. Uh, she's the author of uh, The Emerging Midwest, the author of A Generation at War, The Civil War Era in, nor in a Northern Community. And um, I think y you would agree that Bleeding Kansas is your tour de force book and, uh, and marvelous, uh, uh, a marvelous book. If you're going to read one book on the Civil War in Kansas, uh, where Buffalo Bill's father uh, was a martyr to f uh, keeping Kansas uh, uh, slave free. Uh, that's the book to read. Nicole Etchison. Well, I'll thank Paul for that um, introduction and say my son is going to love it because his uh, favorite phrase is when you were young mom and dinosaurs roamed the earth. So now it's when I was young and Dave Letterman was my student. <laughs> but um, Paul and I had been talking about how I had met him when I was a young historian and I'm no longer a young historian. Uh, and I also want to thank Jeremy and his staff here for the fabulous job that they have done in coordinating this. And my colleague, Doug Seafelt from Ball State, who has a habit of casually meandering into your office and saying, so. And then the next thing you know, you're a Civil War historian and you're in Cody, Wyoming. <laughs> and Doug is the reason I am here uh, to give uh, the perspective of uh, Buffalo Bill's younger years before the Wild West glory that you've been hearing about. For Civil War historians, there are a couple of themes I'm going to talk about and link to Buffalo Bill. And in fact, the first speaker this morning uh, mentioned how Buffalo Bill has been used as a symbol of reconciliation. We get away from that nasty north-south quarrel of his youth and he goes into the Wild West and becomes a figure of reconciliation. There's also in Civil War history been lately a kind of Western turn where people like Heather Cox Richardson have been reminding the people like me who talk about the battles of Antietam and Shiloh and so forth that there was a lot going out uh, on out in the West and that it involved Indians and it involved some, somebody beside Robert E. Lee and, and Ulysses S. Grant. I want to argue this morning that Buffalo Bill is not as reconciliationist a figure as has been argued and that this whole north-south quarrel keeps popping up and that what you actually see in Buffalo Bill's Civil War is the north-south quarrel that happens in the west. When Buffalo Bill was a little boy. His family moved from Iowa out to Kansas, around the, uh, the Salt Creek Valley of Kansas in 1854 when the territory had just been opened up. And this is a different part of Kansas than Jeff showed you. We're over in eastern Kansas by Leavenworth. That's where the Cody's settled. Kansas had just been opened to settlers on the premise of popular sovereignty, which meant that the settlers got to decide whether or not there would be slavery. This was territory that had, before 1854, been closed to slavery. But now when the territory is open and the Cody's settle there, the settlers get to decide whether or not they want to have slavery. 
Uh, like a lot of northern settlers, Isaac Cody was a free state Democrat. That means that he wanted Kansas to be free. It probably also means that he was not an abolitionist and that he was probably, like a lot of free state settlers, fairly racist. In his autobiography, which as Jeff mentioned is highly fictionalized, uh, but that Lewis Warren says that the part about Cody's childhood is the least fictional part. But Buffalo Bill in his autobiography said that Isaac said he wanted Kansas to be a white state where blacks could not settle. This is a very common sentiment among the northern settlers in Kansas. Missourians, however, who do want Kansas to be a slave state, don't make distinctions between different kinds of anti-slavery. They called Isaac Cody a noisy abolitionist. Cody, Isaac, joined the Salt Creek Squatters Association, and I'm indebted to Doug for uh, many of these images. And this is the Salt Creek Valley near Leavenworth. Squatters associations were formed on the frontier to protect the claims that the settlers were making. However, in Kansas, these squatters associations became pretty politicized. And in 1854, uh, Isaac Cody at a meeting of the Salt Creek Squatters Association uh, was pressed to say something. He's, uh, he's an Iowan, he's settler, settled among all these Missourians. They pressure him to make a speech at the association meeting. He does so, and this is the speech in which his son says that Isaac said he wanted Kansas to be a white state. And he was assaulted by a Missourian, and this image is from Cody's autobiography. He's assaulted by a Missourian by the name of Charles Dunn, and he's knifed. Isaac lives, and in fact, the Missouri newspaper that reports the knifing and calls him a noisy abolitionist says it's regrettable that this man, Isaac Cody, is going to live. Some level of hostility there. Uh, Isaac Cody dies in 1857. The family always maintains that he died from this wound that he got. Well, between 1854 and Isaac Cody's death in 1857, we get the turmoil of bleeding Kansas. There are elections which are carried fraudulently by, by the Missourians. There is a free state movement that forms that is illegal but that represents these northern settlers, and Isaac Cody plays a part in this free state movement. There's a guerrilla war in the summer of 1856, and there are various inept attempts by territorial governors and the federal government to restore order. During this time, Isaac Cody is helping settlers move in, he's surveying lands, he's participating in the free state movement, he's elected to this free state legislature, and the Cody's are victims of pro-slavery attacks. Their hay is burned, their livestock is stolen. Isaac Cody has to hide out quite a lot of the time. Again, another image from the autobiography of Isaac Cody fleeing through the night from pro-slavery men who are out to get him. Now, Buffalo Bill claims that when his father was attacked, and fell that he was there and caught his father in his arms. This is probably not true. His sisters at least say that this is not true. But this doesn't mean that young Willie Cody wasn't affected by what was happening with his family. There, Willie and his sisters are in the cabin when Missourians come and threaten the family and come looking for his father. On one occasion, Willie is sick, but his mother sends him from his, his sick bed to go uh, riding off to warn his father that the pro-slavery men are laying in wait for him, and he is nearly caught by the pro-slavery men who are up there in the corner, and Willie manages to escape and warn his father not to come home because these men are waiting for him. When his father dies in 1857, Willie takes over supporting the family. He doesn't apparently ride for the Pony Express, but he is working as a, as a lad to keep his mother and sisters alive. When the National Civil War comes, Willie joins 
the, at first he joins an informal group of what were known as red legs, um, uh, Jayhawkers. These are Kansans, as Cody admits in his autobiography, who they feel the Missourians picked on them in the Kansas Civil War and the National Civil War is their opportunity to cross the border east into Missouri and get their revenge. Uh, so he's, he's in an informal Jayhawking Kansas regiment fighting in Missouri. And then 1864, he joins the Kansas 7th, which is the notorious Jayhawking regiment. If you were a Missourian and I said Kansas 7th, you would know what that meant, even probably today. And they had such a bad reputation for the depredations they were carrying out in Missouri that they got sent away from the Kansas-Missouri border. Uh, he did see some service in the South, and by the end of the war, he's back in St. Louis. Well, what did Buffalo Bill's childhood in Bleeding Kansas and in his youth as a Jayhawker in the Civil War mean to him? He does not seem to have had much interest in people like this woman who was a slave on the Kansas-Missouri border. In his autobiography, all Buffalo Bill says is that when the family moved from Iowa to Kansas, they went through Missouri and he saw blacks. My curiosity was considerably aroused by the many Negroes which I saw. I had scarcely ever seen any colored people. And that's it. He doesn't tell us anything about what they were doing. He doesn't mention trying to talk to them. He saw them and that's about, and he was curious about them and that's it. Very different when he gets to Kansas, and in the autobiography he says, I saw Indians, and they were dark-skinned and rather fantastically dressed people, and I tried to talk to them, he says, but I couldn't understand them. And uh, when he lives there, though, he plays with the Kickapoo children, he learns some of the language, he learns how to shoot a bow and arrow. He's much more interested by 1879 when he writes the autobiography about what's going on with the Indians. He does mention the Missourians. And he describes them in typical northern settler free state fashion as ruffians. They swore a lot. They swaggered about. He does say, uh, he does say that their interactions with his father, they act with honor and fairness. But this was a very northern stereotype about ruffinly, border ruffians is what the northerners called them. Then when he joins the Jayhawkers, he admits that the point of joining the Jayhawkers was to retaliate and get even with the persecutors of the Kansans. Um, he admits that he was a horse thief in, when he was a Jayhawker, but the Jayhawkers also liberated slaves, and he doesn't talk about that, and he doesn't talk about his service with the Freedmen's Bureau in St. Louis. This, as you might imagine, is a Missouri image of what the Jayhawkers did uh, in Missouri, that they grabbed women and uh, committed and looted and burned. There's a very, couple of very interesting stories in the autobiography about Cody's Civil War service. One is about his honeymoon. They're on a steamboat, he and Louisa, on the Missouri River, and some of the Missourians on the boat recognize him and they, they think he's one of, they recognize him as a, as a Kansas Jayhawker and house burner. They telegraph some of their friends and a band of 20 armed Missouri guerrillas right up to the shore and are going to kill, they, they yell, where is the black abolitionist Jayhawker? So they're out to get Cody because of his reputation. They recognize him from something like this. Um, but his wife claims this didn't happen. So again, if he wanted to be a reconciliationist, why bring up this story and announce in 1879 in the autobiography that he has this reputation? The second story he tells is that when he is a scout in Missouri, he comes to a house, uh, uh, there's a lone Missouri woman with her daughters, and Cody intervenes and keeps the Union soldiers from doing this kind of thing that Union soldiers did to Missouri women. 
and that the Missouri women are so grateful they make a dinner for him and then they protect him from their menfolk who come back. And this story probably isn't true, but it's very interesting because he, he not only wants not to be remembered for having done this kind of thing, he wants to be remembered for having protected Missouri women from this, and in fact, this is exactly the kind of thing that would have happened to his mother. M Missouri men coming to the house, threatening her husband. She was, Cody tells us, forced to cook for these pro-slavery border ruffians. So Cody wants to present himself as not like the other unionists, even though at another point in the auto uh, autobiography, he admits sort of being part of this, but he also wants to be better than the Missourians and what they did to, better than the other, excuse me, union, uh, better than the other Missourians and what they were doing to his family. Again, none of this when he talks about the Civil War, he does not bring out the racial aspects. He doesn't talk about slavery or race in this. He does say, in later points in his life, his father had shed the first blood in the cause of the free of freedom of Kansas, but he never really specifies what that means. Although it's interesting, the autobiography is written, uh, is published in 1879, which is the year of the Exoduster migration, when the whole nation was paying attention to the fact that blacks were leaving the Reconstruction South and moving into Kansas. So there was an indelible link between Kansas and race that would have been in people's minds, not just because of the Kansas Civil War, but because of the 1879 Exoduster movement. Uh, Cody also did other things that played up his connection to the Civil War. Um, he very much plays up, he gets Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, to provide a, a letter um, attesting to Cody's scouting abilities for him when Cody didn't actually make that scout for him. So he goes out of his way to get testimony from Sherman endorsing him, and in the autobiography plays up very much his relationship with Sheridan. And Paul Hutton can enlighten us more on this, but these are figures, yes, Sherman and Sheridan are very much involved with the Indian Wars, but you can't in the 1879 say Sherman and Sheridan in the South and not bring up Kansas, uh, excuse me, uh, George, the burning of Georgia, the march to the sea, or Sheridan's depredations in the Shenandoah Valley. That is really not reconciliationist company that he is keeping there. Cody does mention race in the autobiography. Uh, he makes a lot of fun of the Buffalo soldiers. He uses dialect. He uses racist uh, language. Um, he has a story about how they are tracking Indians and a black cavalryman shoots off his gun, uh, gets scared or careless, and this warns the Indians. So the cavalryman is punished, and here's the drawing from the autobiography, by having to walk back to Fort Hayes. He doesn't have uh, very heroic stories about the Buffalo soldiers. He has a lot of uh, ethnic stereotypes about the Irish as well. He did fight Indians during his, not during the Civil War, but has been mentioned earlier, uh, the scalp taking in the duel with yellow hand or yellow hair. Uh, I would point out, you Western historians will situate this in, in, the, in the Indian Wars, but I would point out, it's very interesting, Missouri guerrillas took scalps. They took scalps of white people and put them on their horses' bridles. And coming from the Kansas, Missouri region, I have to think Cody knew about that tradition and that it was embedded in, the, in his Civil War background. Then we get to the dime novels. And I'll just talk about the first one because some historians have said it's really odd that Ned Buntline's first dime novel is about the Kansas-Missouri border. Why, why do that? Well, I argue because Kansas, Missouri, and that North-South conflict are still part of Buffalo Bill's Civil War. Uh, in fact, in the novel, the Cody's think that they're being attacked by the Indians, but it turns out they're being attacked by Missourians who are worse than Indians. 
they shoot Isaac Cody, calling him a black worshiper, an abolitionist. Uh, there's threats to rape of the Cody women folk. Um, I, and, and this is all, if you went back to free state propaganda of the 1850s, rape threats, uh, savage violence, meaning Missouri violence, is all there. And fortunately, Cody will rescue his women folk before they have to resort to self-destruction. There's even the burning by the Missourians of a fictional town called Corinne. Well, this is Quantrill's raid on Lawrence, Kansas in 1863. It's turning up in this Cody fiction. And the Missourians, in the novel at least, are in league with the Cheyenne. It's the Missourians and the Cheyenne. And then later we get the Missourians in the Sioux. Like the Missourians didn't have anything to do with the Cheyenne and the, this, this is all, this is where Buttline brings the Western stuff and the North South together. And in fact, by the end of the novel, Buttline has forgotten completely about the Missourians and he just has Buffalo Bill Cody fighting the Indians. Um, the other big dime novel that plays with these Civil War themes is uh, Buffalo Bill's Pards in Gray, where Texas Jack, who's a Texan, wants to join the Union Army, even though he's a former Confederate, after the Civil War. And he can, because it's not the Northern Army anymore, it's the Union Army. Well, Buffalo Bill, according to the novel, and Texas Jack became friends during the Civil War. I think Texas Jack uh, wrecked uh, rescued Cody, um, but now after the Civil War, this really is a re very reconciliationist uh, piece, now they can be openly pards in, gr um, pards, blue and gray in the army, uh, in the post-Civil War army. There are remnants of the Union North-South conflict even in the Wild West show, Sergeant Bates, who is a GAR, a uh, Union veteran who is prominent. He's the uh, one who presents the flag to Queen Victoria when the Wild West show goes overseas. Um, there are Union veterans as well as Spanish-American War veterans and Women's Relief Corps, that's the uh, Union veteran women's auxiliary organization, takes uh, part in the funeral, which as we all know now was in Denver. Although it should not, I, I, I'm willing to be converted. I had no dog in this fight, of Denver versus Cody, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go with Cody here. <laughs> and they play the Civil War song, tenting on the old campground at Cody's funeral because it was Cody's favorite song, evidently. So I would argue that Cody's life story, Cody's Civil War was not straightforwardly reconciliationist, and it was not one where he straightforwardly abandoned that north-south conflict of his boyhood, uh, that it was instead his Civil War one that had north and south, and it had east and west, it had African Americans, and it had Missourians and northerners and southerners and Indians as well, and that's probably a good cast for the United States Civil War. Thank you.